Before we begin, I would like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teachings and work at Del Seton Medical Center. Any discussions we have on this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and in no way connected to Del Seton Medical Center. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Life of Flow. Hola. My name is Lucas Ferrer. This is Miguel Montero Baker. And today we are lucky to have Austin Hankwitz. He basically creates a personal finance and investing content that empowers everyone to become an educated investor. Uh, he's an angel investor and the co-host of the Rich Habits podcast. And Miguel? It was a phenomenal conversation. Um, I think for everybody out there like ourselves that has focused on medicine so long, it's great to have some tips on how to create wealth and how to protect it. So Stay tuned. And I think you'll enjoy it. Financial mm -hmm. advice, by the way. This, we are cavemen in finance. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Two vascular surgeons walk into a bar and come out with a podcast. We are talking everything vascular and not. Welcome to the Life of Flow podcast. All right, Austin. Welcome to the Life of Flow podcast. This is one of those episodes where we don't talk at all about medicine and we talk about other things. Um, so we are so happy that you, you were graceful enough to, to, to give us some time. So I'll let you do a little bit of an introduction of yourself uh, and then we can just take it wherever it goes. Sure. hundred percent. Hey everyone. How's it going? My name's Austin Hankwitz. I feel like most recently people might recognize me from being the co-host of the number five business podcast on Spotify called Rich Habits. But that's very recent. We'll talk about that in here in a second. But um, yeah, more about me is I'm 27. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I graduated from the University of Tennessee back in 2018 with my degree in finance and economics. I did that, uh, or I took that rather, to Nashville, Tennessee to do mergers and acquisitions for a publicly traded healthcare company uh, called Emeticis. They're one of the nation's largest home health hospice and personal care companies. Very, you know, huge respect for the healthcare industry and all the awesome people listening right now, as well as you uh, gentlemen here. Um, but yeah, so what happened was in March of 2020, obviously the pandemic was rippling through our country. I started working from home and I had this weird desire to just talk about, again, I was like 24, I guess at the time. Um, and I just had this weird desire to talk about my journey of trying to pay off my student loans, buy my first house, build my credit score, just very personal finance related topics. And I tried to talk about it on YouTube. I got like three views. I, I have no idea how to edit a video. It was terrible. So I ended up looking around and all my friends were like, dude, I'm on TikTok. Have you heard of TikTok yet? All these people are dancing and lip sync. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to dance or lip sync, but I, instead I'm going to talk about buying a first house or retirement investing, things of that nature, right? And people loved it. They ate it up. I mean, my first video got like a million and a half views in three days. It was absolutely incredible. And so it just kind of, you know, light bulb moment of like, wait a second, people actually care about people being vulnerable and open about their personal finance journey, especially right out of college. And, you know, that I, I was just sort of one niche of, of a human here. But um, so I guess long story short, what had happened was I created a Patreon account that uh, allowed me to sort of begin monetizing and getting sort of tips, quote unquote, from my audience um, that sort of unlocked DMs and posts and live streams I was hosting on a weekly basis. That Patreon sort of platform has now migrated to a Substack uh, publication that I author called Rate of Return. We've got about 12,000 people hanging out with us over there. Um, I also uh, do a lot of, I guess, growth marketing consulting for a plethora of companies. Think public.com, Charles Schwab, uh, a bunch of really cool fintechs. And now more recently, host the uh, Rich Habits podcast with Robert Croak, who is a 53-year-old DECA millionaire who uh, became more famous recently, uh, recently, maybe a decade ago, uh, from creating silly bands, these bracelets that had like little animals and different objects. It was a really interesting phenomenon that happened in the, the mid-2010s. But so that is me. I'm really, really excited to be here. I feel like at the end of the day, these conversations are going to hopefully help a lot of people not just understand what other people are thinking about money, but I really just want the, the purpose of this podcast to truly have people say, wait a second, now is my time to start you know, really caring about my credit score, my student loan debt, buying my first house you know, all, re retirement investing, all those things that maybe people get overwhelmed about. They don't have, have everyone explain it to them in a way that is interesting or uh, digestible. So I am pumped about this episode. I'm going to say, Austin, I've, um, I'm a, 
I'm a follower uh, and I admire your work. I think what you guys did was just brilliant. The way you said, hey, let's get youth and then experience. And then let's see what happens, right? Because you, uh, I love the intro that you, uh, you, I'm trying to make it and he's already made it. And uh, it's really cool. It creates a good dynamic um, and one dynamic that you can relate to, right? Because in a way you're projecting yourself on these two characters that are two phases in your life. Life of Flow is our podcast and this is our new project, but our niche is physicians and probably more specialized physicians that have gone through extra training, residencies, fellowships, uh, and even sub fellowships in a lot of times. And so they get sucked in for many years and then we finally make it and we finally go and get our jobs. And that could be, you know, very, very different ballpark salaries that you may face, but overall they're good. They're good income salaries. But at this point you've invested so much in your career and so much time and possibly also some debt involved in that, mm -hmm. that you're starting to, you know, to try to build that. And, you know, I, I was really happy that you agreed. Lucas said uh, that, that he was able to get in touch with you through CJ. And for us, it's, it's a blessing to be able to then pick your brain because I guess I'd love to set the stage today for the conversation of through the scope. And I didn't know, by the way, that healthcare stuff of you, that's new to me. I just, I just learned that from, from you. So, so I see that healthcare is kind of near and dear to you. So through the scope, let's try to set the stage today for the following few minutes that we're sharing with you is for our audience that are physicians, maybe in the first few years uh, that are already having their, their salary, finally breathing oxygen because it's a, a pretty nice jump when you live, leave residency or fellowship and you get a real job and you start seeing a little bit of money. How should we arrange ourselves? And, and I guess as physicians, we think a couple of things. Start getting that 401k real quick because we're eventually going to somehow when we finish our yeah. training, all we're thinking about is retirement. retirement. <laughs> yeah. But we're 401k very quickly and sometimes pretty automatic in, our, in the majority of our jobs. But it's a long time before you could actually articulate that or you can you, you know, take that without penalties. And then also, if you have a little fluff money, what could you do it? And how could you potentially do a controlled gamble? And so there's two topics, I think, that we discussed uh, before going on live, which was one thing called a bridge account, which is something you can potentially build as you're moving into that retirement phase and that you can monetize or, or utilize a little bit earlier on. And then the other thing is a controlled bet on angel investing, which is essentially pretty early investing and who better than you to, to walk us through that and so i'd say let's uh, tackle first what this bridge yeah. this bridge account and how that that would work because i'm i'm very interested in that and then as we segue to the end we'll talk a little bit of what you do with the fluff money mm -hmm. and how those angel investments can work and how long they take but we'll we'll go to it so let's start with with bridge accounting i love it so actually let's take a step back real quick about the 401k right i think a misconception people hear a lot is like a 401k. It's an investment strategy. I'm good to go. I just kind of forget about it. It takes money out of my paycheck. There's always going to be something there in 30 years. I really want to encourage everyone listening right now to kind of put that on its head. I don't think a 401k is an investment strategy. I feel like a lot of people, unfortunately, really good example, my lawyer friend, Jacob, right? Jacob makes a quarter million a year. He's 28. He does his little 401k stuff. And he's like, man, my, my 401k is only, you know, I've been doing this for four years. I'm only up like 4% annually now, but the stock market's ripping. I don't know what's going on. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, you have to think about what are you investing into, right? A lot of people just have this set it and forget it mentality of, oh, my employer's going to figure it out. The money's invested. It's all there. I'm not going to worry about it. That's not what you should be doing, right? You should like really care about exactly what this money is invested into. Now, Generally speaking, 401ks are kind of limited, right? So you might have to like choose specific mutual funds. You might have to choose specific index funds. At the end of the day, if you have autonomy over your 401k, you want as much of that money to be invested into long standing index funds. Think the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, uh, things of that nature, right? So VOO, uh, QQQ. Um, and, and if you have the mutual funds, that's, you, know, you rather, let me say, you only are able to invest in mutual funds, log on to whatever website that you have at your employer for the 401k and look up specifically what those ticker symbols are. It's going to be a five for mutual funds. I think it's five or six uh, letters here. 
and then just Google the, the ticker symbol. And then normally what pops up on perhaps Morningstar or even Seeking Alpha, these different websites that people can use to analyze the performances, you see what's exactly what's inside of them. You see their expense ratios and you see their longstanding performance. Now, if that longstanding performance has outperformed the S&P 500, that's great. You're probably good to go then as long as you're pretty comfortable with it. But nine times out of 10, it doesn't, right? And a lot of people here, unfortunately get like, again, sucked into this mentality of, oh, I'm investing X amount of dollars every paycheck. I'll be fine. My money's going to be there. It's all good, which like, that's great. That's a good first step. But like the next step is really saying, okay, what are you investing into though? And making sure that what you're investing into is going to continue to perform well over the long term. So just want everyone to like level set on that, right? The 401k is not an investment strategy. It's a way to uh, get you started, but you have to then really execute upon that strategy yourself. The, what you said about your lawyer friend exactly happened to me. I was like looking at my 401k and then I'm like, oh, this doesn't make too much sense. And then I read a book called The uh, Little Book of Common Sense Investing. You yep, know that one? Yeah, John C. Bogle. Yeah. And then I put, I said, I just had started. I was like a year in. I said, so I was like, okay, I'm going to put everything on just for now, for my early career on an S&P 500 index with whatever the term is for your low rates, uh, because you have to look at the the percentages that you get charged also, because those, those eat away and compound. So I was like, oh my God. So I did that. Should I just keep it? I mean, and the, I'm thinking now that I'm like, you know, that was when I was 36, just started at 35, you know, making uh, a salary as an attending. I was thinking, okay, maybe someday I'll need to change this back to something more, varied but for the moment i'm just gonna keep it at this because this makes sense to me i would absolutely focus on the s p 500 so it's really cool what is the s p 500 it's the standard and poor's 500 largest and most profitable companies in the united states and what's really cool about that is they have this sort of self-cleansing process so they have it's very rules based and it's like five or six different rules i don't have them memorized here so just take my word for it but essentially what happens is if a company that's in these 500 largest list here is not profitable for so many quarters, it will be taken out of the index and something else will be added to it. A really good example of this, of something that was added to it recently that was headline news was Tesla, right? Tesla is a massive company. It's a $700, $800 billion company, but they weren't profitable for a very long time. So they were not in the S&P 500 until recently. I think that was called late 2020, maybe early 2021. But yes, and what, so, so, for everyone listening, S and P, set it and forget it. It will itself. It's self cleansing. It does everything. You know, it's it's all good. And the best part is, it has uh, since nineteen, I think twenty seven, when it was uh, originally created here, average annual returns of eleven point eight eight percent over the last hundred years. So who who wants to argue with that, right? Little book of common sense investing. Everybody should read it. By there you go, guys. What was the author? John C. Bogle, who is actually the founder of Vanguard, which we all have probably heard of Vanguard before. So add it to, uh, to your list. Uh, read it on the next boring meeting with administration at the hospital. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Uh, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, Austin, but keep going. On. Totally. So, all right. So we've got the 401k figured out. You guys listening now are like actually caring about what you're invested into and you've done the analysis and that, that's all fun and games. Cool. So you've maxed that out. You're making likely hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. You're maxing that out every single year. Something else I really want to encourage folks to do, just a little bit of a sprinkle on top, is a backdoor Roth IRA. It's on the retirement account. You want to max that out the same way. It's about 6500 bucks a year. It's not too much of a needle mover in the short term, but with compound interest, it'll probably turn out to about a million dollars over a 30-year period if you continue to max that out. Uh, and again, it's called a backdoor Roth IRA because I'm assuming most of you listening make over a hundred and I think thirty five thousand a year, which is the income cap for just the the Roth IRA. So you're gonna do the backdoor. Look it up on uh, on Google. There's a bunch of really cool uh, articles on. Uh, if it's Fidelity or Investopedia that are going to walk you through exactly how to do that backdoor thing so you can invest toward it, which is, again, an awesome retirement vehicle. And same S&P 500. So let's assume now you're feeling good about retirement, right? 59 and a half, 60, 65, you're going to have your nest egg, right? But to your point, right, what about the people who, and I would fall into one of these you know, brackets, I'm a high income, what is it, uh, a Henry High High earner, not yet rich or something like that. Well, I guess maybe I'm, I'm rich, but that's not what I'm trying to say. I guess what I'm saying is I fall into this bucket of, you know, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars a year, right? So it's like I max out these retirement accounts. I'm having a good time, but I don't want to be working until I'm 59 and a half. I don't want to work till I'm 65, like everyone's sort of traditional retirement. So, and, and what's problematic about these 59 and a half and 65 numbers here, right, is 
this retirement funds, all these your 401ks, the, the IRAs, things of that nature, you are not allowed to touch that money without paying taxes and penalty fees, right? Taxes are going to come around 25 to 30%. Penalty fees are going to be about 10 or 15%. So you're essentially, you're not going to be able to touch this money without paying 40 cents of every dollar away in taxes and fees. And that's that's a terrible idea. Don't, don't do that, right? So now the, the problem is, wait a second, how do I enjoy my perhaps late 40s or early 50s, you know, my 50s before I'm able to, uh, you know, have access to these accounts. And so that's where this idea of a bridge account comes into play. So as someone who is 27 and has always maxed out his retirements, I'll have, you know, several million dollars in retirement when I'm ready to touch that at 59 and a half. I also don't want to be working until I'm 59 and a half. And so what I've done is I've created this $2 million portfolio goal for me to create and build upon over the next 8 to 15 years. Again, I have no idea how the stock market's going to do over the next 8 to 15 years. So that's why I kind of had it a nice big kind of range there to achieve this number, as well as I don't know how my income is going to fluctuate. But long story short here is if I'm able to build a account, a taxable normal brokerage account that you open up on public.com, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, it's totally taxable and normal, right? But if I can put and invest in compound interest over the next 10, 12, 15 years here, um, and it'd be worth $2 million, well, there's this awesome rule called the 4% rule that essentially says you can take out 4% of your total portfolio value every single year and never run out of money, generally speaking, right? And especially if we're just going to do that for, call it a decade before we hit that retirement, we're certainly not going to spend $2 million in a decade, right? So that's what's so fun about this is like, wait a second, I now have this opportunity as a high earner. So the same people here listening to not just max out my retirement, definitely have the, the millions in retirement to enjoy uh, when I'm older, but I now also need to be a little bit more strategic with my money. So if I do want to kind of have that 80, 100, $150,000 in sort of passive portfolio income coming at me in a decade from now, I can have that opportunity. And I think a lot of people listening right now might not have ever thought about that, or, or instead they think about maybe I want to go get a bigger house or a nicer car or go on that luxury vacation three times a year or whatever it might be here. People don't think about how do I supplement my income or even replace my earned income? Now, sure. You might not be able to, and I certainly haven't yet figured out how to replace four, six, eight hundred thousand dollars in earned income, right? That that that's a specialty for sure. But it is absolutely viable to replace a hundred, one hundred fifty, maybe even two hundred thousand dollars of that income in passive portfolio income. And so that's the goal of this bridge account is to have a way where perhaps you're 45 or you're 47 and you know you're going to have to work another, you know, call it 10, 12, 15 years before you can really touch that retirement money. But maybe I only want to work part-time. Maybe I want to take three months off a year, right? I, I feel like that's the sort of utility here of this bridge account and why it's so important for people to consider. Okay. So how do we do this? Step one, you go to public.com, P-U-B-L-I-C.com. Uh, they're an online brokerage like TD Ameritrade, Tw TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, or even Robinhood if you are a youngster. Um, but yeah, public.com, they're awesome. It's who I use. And then you just start depositing money into it, right? This is money that's hit your bank account. This is after-tax funds. There's no tax advantage to this, right? All the tax advantage sort of loopholes, quote unquote, that people talk about. That's the 401k. That's the backdoor IRA. We're already doing that stuff, right? So those are the loopholes. We're already doing that stuff here. So what we're now focused on is that bridge account. Now, the bridge account is going to be taxable. Again, this is money that's already deposited into your bank account. But once you create an account on public.com, you just obviously type in your name, your uh, email address. Obviously, this is a, a uh, IRS very focused account where you're going to have to pay taxes. So don't be alarmed when they ask for your home address or your social security number. And just start depositing money into this account. Again, call it five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, how much you want to start out with here. But again, now, what are you going to be investing into? The S&P 500, right? The S&P 500, it's this awesome index fund, set it and forget it. <laughs> You can absolutely expect, you know, these nine, 10, 12 percent returns annually. By doing this, you you deposit and invest fifty, one hundred, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, which might sound like a lot to a lot of people, which it definitely is. But if you're making four, six, eight hundred thousand, you know, that's only ten percent, fifteen percent of your of your salary here, which is certainly doable. 
So that is how someone does this, right? They, they, they go to an online brokerage of their choice, they create the account, and they just begin investing into a uh, index fund like the S&P 500. And then, right, once it's time to begin to enjoy this money, you can take out 4%, 6%, maybe even 8% if you'd like. Or there's another way to kind of think about this is you can sort of tweak the holdings inside of this portfolio to pay you passive income through dividends, right? This might be uh, an ETF like SCHD. This might be an ETF like SPYI, right? There's a ton of different ETFs that focus on income for the income-focused investor. And as you build this bridge account and you're looking to you know, really begin to take in that passive income, passive portfolio income here of the tune of six, eight, ten thousand $10,000 a month, that is eventually what this would turn into, especially if you've tweaked it for that income-focused investor uh, holding. Once you put the money there, uh let's say that I ran into some sort of family emergency and I need the funds. How does that work out? And and what's the penalty to, to remove funds from an account like this? Yeah, so there wouldn't be any penalty at all, right? This is the same normal taxable brokerage account that uh, millions of people opened up on Robinhood to go gamble on GameStop two years ago, right? These are just normal everyday funds, everyday accounts. There's no penalties. There's no fees. There's nothing of that sort. However, to that point, a good question here. Before you do any of this, even before you invest toward your retirement, I want you to have an emergency fund, right? You should you should absolutely have three to six months of expenses saved up inside of a high yield savings account, or even I don't know, it sounds like I'm plugging public here. I'm really not. They're just a great platform. Public.com has a T bills product, a Treasury bills product, where essentially you can deposit this emergency fund. Call it for me, it's fifty thousand dollars. So I have my fifty thousand dollar emergency fund inside of Public's platform. I make 5.6% APY on this $50,000 emergency fund. And the best part is because it's T-bills, treasury bills, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the US government. And because they're T-bills, unlike a high yield savings account, uh, it is not taxed at the state or local levels. So if you live in a high, um, think California, think New York's uh, New York, or one of these sort of states where the state income tax is 8, 9, 10, 12%, you would have to pay ordinary uh, income tax on your interest earned with a high yield savings account, where with T-bills, you wouldn't have to do that because, again, this is uh, a treasury product by the U.S. government. So definitely have this emergency fund figured out before you start investing. And Public is an awesome platform, in my opinion, where you can sort of have this all-in-one view of your emergency fund as well as this nice bridge account that you're building. And uh, there's a couple other perks that the platform has that I, that I enjoy. But, but yeah, that's what I really would want to encourage everyone to do before even considering investing toward retirement in the traditional way of a 401k. Why not have your emergency fund in an investment account? So you, you certainly could, um, and that's kind of what this T-bill is, is trying to help you kind of achieve, right? So let's say it was in, a, in, in an investment account. You'd make, let's call it again, this 10%, 11% annually. But again, the stock market's down 6% so far in just August, right? So like that's what you don't want to really happen to your emergency fund, right? Let's say you have this $50,000 and the stock market tanked last year, 2022, it was down 20%. Right, that's ten thousand dollars now shaved off your emergency fund. You don't, you don't want that. So with uh, you kind of get the best of both worlds with a T bill account. There's no volatility because they're just T bills, treasury bills by uh, you know six month T bills by the U.S. government. But you do also get just a little bit of sprinkle of some appreciation, right? That five point six percent on top. So no volatility while also a little bit of appreciation to keep up with inflation. I could say okay, I could do that, and I have no tax benefits. Why don't I just put that? money into real estate. You certainly can. Absolutely. So here's the deal, right? I'm I'm 27. I've got hundreds of thousands of dollars in my personal retirement accounts that I can't touch until I am, you know, 59 and a half, which will be worth several million. I own two properties here in Nashville, Tennessee. I own a vending machine business. Um, I, I've got I've got so many different ways to help supplement my income now as someone who's working all the time uh, in a hospital or as, as a surgeon here might not have that flexibility from from a time management perspective. But the answer is yes. There is no is or. It's always both, in my opinion, especially with real estate. I mean, at the end of the day here, real estate is an incredible, incredible asset. You're able to not only not only does real estate appreciate in value and 
bring you passive income through rents and things of that nature, but you're also able to depreciate the asset against your earned income. Now, that's not something I'm an expert in. Uh, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm learning it myself right now, but I, I certainly am an expert in the, uh, the, the stocks and investing and those certain, you know, those types of accounts there. So we can talk all about that. But yes, no, the, the answer to your question is real estate is, is definitely something that people should be considering and doing as well. And is there a point in time when you're coming close to retirement where, it, you know, where we should, you know, turn some of that S&P 500 I don't know, stocks or what into bonds like, you know, you're. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, do that. And, and, and here's here's the reason why. Right. Just what you were saying, uh, Lucas, here before is, you know, why not have my savings account invested as well? I, I could, you know, make some money. That's true. Right. But that also comes with the volatility of the stock market. Just like we saw last year, it was down about 20%. It's down about 6% now in just the month of August from recent all-time highs in late July. So we've seen that volatility. And some people, as they edge closer to retirement, they don't want any volatility. Now, I'm not mad at that. However, I think a lot of people make the mistake of of having bond exposure too soon in their investing journey. I think a lot of people see, okay, I just hit 50 or I'm 55. It's time to really hunker down and go all in on bonds here, which you know, in actuality, I, I don't think that's that great of an idea because at the end of the day, you're not going to... You, the amount of money that you have at 65 in your retirement account that you're ready to touch and the millions of dollars you're ready to enjoy, it's not going away in the stock market, right? First off, but also like, you're going to live till you're 85 years old. And to do that in a comfortable way, you need the compound interest that comes with owning the volatile stock market. So sure, 20, 25%, maybe 30% in bonds, right? Go check out CSHI or T-bills or you know different types of uh, sort of less volatile um, you know, instruments. But I do really want to encourage people to have 50, 60, 70, perhaps even 80% of their sort of portfolios, even in retirement, invested into the markets. Because I mean, if you had a $5 million retirement portfolio, which is, I feel like, super attainable, assuming the you know people here listening do make that three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 a year, that 10% of five, that's $500,000 a year in additional compound interest, right? Why would you want to leave that? Why would you only want 250? Because the other half was in bonds making 2%, 3%. Great. So maybe we can start pivoting into what we initially discussed, which is, all right, <clears throat> I'm maxed out. I've got all my savings. I have a, the job's going well. I know that you know, physicians usually have solid career paths. You may change jobs because you don't like the people, but in general terms, the salaries tend to be stable. And still, there may be a little fluff, uh, you know, and, and you may still be in a position where you want to uh, do an investment additional to that. And so I know that you are very knowledgeable when it comes to the term angel investment. And that's something that we hear a lot of, but we don't know about because obviously we're interested in the cells and the mechanism of how they work and all these things. And then we just forego some of this other knowledge basis. And so could you enlighten a little bit of uh, our audience as to what is angel investment and who would you advise to do it and how labor intense is it? Uh, you know, the, some, some tips on how to go about it. And then maybe towards the end, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to what not to do, <laughs> because I, I've been burned with uh, with this a little bit in the past. I think, Lucas, you haven't, haven't been involved it. in any angel investment. Okay. So by all means, uh, Austin, what, what, walk us through this. So if I kind of rewind here to late 2020, early 2021, I was creating content on TikTok. I was doing my fun newsletter. Everyone kind of knew who I was. And I began getting approached by fintech startups. Hey, Austin, we just built this app that we think is going to revolutionize the way people invest. Hey, Austin, we just did this. We think you should be a part of it. We'd love for you to talk about our app. We want this, that, that, and the other. Public.com, again, really good example here. I participated in their Series D. They raised $220 million. I wrote them a check because uh, I love the platform, believe in what they're doing. And so that is kind of how I got into this, right? It was like, I realize as a content creator, there's no IPO, there's no exit that I'm going to experience. The only way that I'm going to have an absolute just influx of hundreds of thousands or some sort of millions of dollars 
uh, by making a right decision is if I own equity in a business that can have an exit, that can you know have some sort of IPO, something of that nature. Because again, I don't want to work for the rest of my life. I want to enjoy my 40s and 50s. And so that's how I got into angel investing. I was like, wait a second, if I can have an outsized impact on a company by sharing that company with my audience, by encouraging other content creators or other you know podcasters to be talking about this company to their audiences, then I want equity in that business. I want some skin in the game. So long story short here, I've invested into 28 startups over the last, call it now, three years. This total sum of money was probably between four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. The average check size, like the smallest check I ever wrote, was for fifteen thousand. The largest check I ever wrote was recently uh, ninety thousand. So they they certainly range um, all over the place. Now, why why would you want to invest into a startup? What's what's the deal here? What what angel investing? I don't understand. Think Shark Tank, right? Think you are Mark Cuban. Or um, what's her name? Barbara Corcoran, right? S- sitting there on that um, on that chair, and someone saying, "Hey, I've got this awesome idea called Scrub Daddy, and we're crushing it, and we're doing hundred million dollars in sales, blah blah blah." Do you want to be a part of this journey? Because we really want your audience, we want your expertise, we want your perspective, we want your connections, whatever. And they want you to be a part of their cap table, which is their cap table is essentially just the you know sort of, uh, you can kind of think about it like an actual table, like a boardroom table, but the cap table is who has equity in this company, right? Who are the uh, dozens of people or organizations or sort of uh, venture capital firms that have equity in this company. Now, why Angel Invest? Because back to kind of what we were alluding to in our earlier conversation, right? You have a little bit of uh, money to gamble with. I think I think I heard the term gamble from you. And that's exactly what this is, right? You are gambling because there are for every company that IPOs on the stock market and makes their investors billions of dollars. There's a hundred companies that got invested billions of dollars into that never made it and they shut their doors and everyone lost their money, right? That's what this is. So if you can kind of have that, if you do have that extra fluff, here's what I would encourage folks to think of. One, how much money every year are you willing to set aside as a 10, 15, 20, $25,000, right? You've already got the emergency fund. You've already done the 401k, the bridge accounts rocking and rolling, but you actually, you have this extra money. What, what is that amount of money that you're willing to just put in the backyard, sit on fire and walk away from it and just not feel anything? Because that's what you got to emotionally and mentally think here. Like I'm giving this person money and it is just going to blow up my face or it's going to be something really cool. And I have to be very comfortable with both of those scenarios. So what is that amount of money to you? But let's just say it's $25,000. So let's say someone listening right now, they're like, okay, I can afford $25,000 a year to be very uh, aggressive with these uh, investments called angel investing here, where I come in and I have the opportunity to invest into an early idea or a company that's very early in its career. It might be you know, generating revenue. It might have a product. It might not, right? That's how early we are in some of our investments. Um, and that's normally called the seed round uh, sometimes you hear pre-seed, but it's pre-seed and seed round. So it goes pre-seed, seed, series A, B, C, D, and all the way down the alphabet. And then you have IPO at some point. So you're coming in the pre-seed or the seed round, sometimes series A if you can you know, swing it. But normally once a company is series A, they're you know, lots of revenue. Venture capitalists know who they are and they're coming in to take your spot. And so long story short here, the goal is to find those companies that you can you know, have some sort of outsized impact on? Is it your experience? Is it your network? How can you provide value to this company? Because again, this is an investment that you have money into, right? You want them to succeed. You want them to be profitable. You want them to either get acquired or perhaps IPO or, or something of that nature. And when you do these things, you need to have the mentality that this is a long-term game, seven, nine, 12 years long. I mean, how long was Airbnb uh, a privately held company before they hit the stock market. Um, how long was Kava, right? And what the Mediterranean fast casual restaurant? How long were they private before they IPO'd earlier this year? Same thing with Shark Ninja, you know, the um, the appliances company. There's tons of these different awesome, cool companies that are private for seven, nine, 10, 12 years before they either one hit the stock market or two uh, have some sort of exit. Now, by exit, uh, you know, some, that means they're getting acquired by by somebody else. Um, now. Last question is, well, wait a second, Austin, how do I find these companies? What, wh- who wants to take my money? How do I do that? There's a couple websites. Uh, there's angellist.com. You can get on their deal flow email list. Uh, it's super easy to do. Um, essentially what happens are 
either syndications, which are groups of people come together and they're looking for investors to kind of toss up some funds into their uh, syndication and uh, they will invest the, your funds on uh, your behalf into cool startups you all agree on. Um, so you can do that through AngelList or you can find uh, specific companies that are raising money uh, through AngelList's uh, platform there. And then kind of back to this idea though of SVB or S um, uh, syndications is you, I, I mean, it's kind of one of my favorite ways to invest is through syndications, right? I do not have so much time, energy, and focus to always be finding the next awesome, cool startup where my friend Nate O'Brien and Sebastian Fung, the two guys that run um, Roadrunner uh, VC, I think it's uh, roadrunner.vc is their website. They've invested into a ton of really cool fintechs and creator economy companies over the last several years. And I trust their judgment. And obviously we get investor updates and everything of that nature. But I think for people listening right now, the easiest way to really begin to build up their portfolios to carve out that 10, 15, $25,000 a year, say, I'm going to put it into a syndication with a hundred other investors. So we now have a million dollars or two or $3 million. And now we're going to start making $50,000 bets on companies that we were able to find. And you now have a sliver of that $50,000 bet, if that makes sense. Let me jump in uh, to give a little more color for the audience. The SEC uh, has placed some rail guards, though, to this sort of investment. And not everybody can just go online and decide to invest, even if they have certain money. In other words, you have to prove that you are a certain profile. Would you explain to our uh, audience uh, how it is that, that you prove this process, who can or cannot get in here, and probably why physicians likely are actually good candidates? Really good question. So the kind of uh, term that you're alluding to is accredited investor, right? Correct. So accredited investors are people who either have a $1 million net worth not including their home, or they make over $250,000 per year and expect to make the same, if not more, the following year. So if you have a million dollar net worth, congratulations, you're now accredited. Or if you've made $250,000 for the last two years and you expect to make that, if not more next year, congratulations, you're now accredited. So um, to your point, yes, the SEC is definitely weird about like, why wait, why would a college kid who's making four, you know, 40 bucks uh, you know, doing this waiting tables over here, trying to invest in the startups. I don't think he knows what he's doing. Let's make sure he's not, you know, being crazy here, right? I understand why these accredited investor sort of parameters and guardrails make sense. They want to make sure that people who have earned money and have the flexibility and the extra money to even lose can afford to lose that those funds if, if the investment goes south. Now, something else though that happened, I think it was under the Obama administration, was back in 20, maybe 13 or 14, um, they made it a little bit looser where people who are not accredited investors are able to invest up to $2,000 per year toward these sort of lucrative startup investment ideas. And we've seen a couple websites and businesses um, come out of that passing, that regulatory passing, very, very popular one is called startengine.com. It's backed by Kevin O'Leary of Shark Tank. Another popular one is republic.com or republic.co, one of the two there, but it's called Republic. Uh, it's, it's all startup investing. And I think another one's called WeFunder, uh, W-E and then Funder, F-U-N-D-E-R. So these are all different websites that people who might not be accredited investors can still go to, find some really, really cool startups. I found one uh, that was doing mocktails. I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of that. My girlfriend doesn't like to drink alcohol too often. So she's always doing these little mocktails and uh, it's it's awesome. She loves them. And now there's this company that is just crushing it. Uh, I think it's called Drink Monday or something. And uh, long story short, I mean, they've got a cool partnership with Drizzly. Like they're doing all this like you know, tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Like these are decent companies that anyone can invest into, not even accredited, right? Anyone uh, on these websites like Start Engine. WeFunder and Republic.com. So definitely go check those out. Uh, you know, for those listening right now, I'd imagine most of you probably are accredited, but if you are not, there's still really cool options for you out there. Quick question. So, you know, we have 
a certain amount of end knowledge to a very specific thing. And, you know, you can't really te teach it. You can train, like, people go through fellowship. But, but even, like, at your level, Miguel, there's things that you have learned in your field that would probably give you a really big edge against any other type of investor in that field, which is vascular. Or so I'm talking about, you know, device, medical devices involved in vascular. Is there any way that I can look for startups in that specific field where I have this immense amount of knowledge? You know, if I decide to do this, I do this in the more kind of informed way possible because I, you know, I know nothing about mocktails. I don't go out that much. Uh, so I'm probably going to be a bad investor in that area. But I'll probably be maybe better than average picking in a certain area. So is there a way that I can look for specific things in my area of very specific knowledge uh, so I can be a better investor? Really good question. And that kind of comes back to the idea of invest into things that you are knowing of, right? I think a lot of people unfortunately make the mistake of seeing the headlines of this crazy, cool biotech AI company is up 100% and they FOMO into the stock on uh, maybe their you know, public.com or TD Ameritrade platform, and then they lose their money because they just had no idea what they were buying, right? Where they should have bought Costco stock because they shop at Costco every Saturday, or they should have bought Home Depot stock because they are a Home Depot uh, regular. So I totally love that uh, question, Lucas. How to find them? So I, I think I'd do a couple things. Um, the first thing I would do very simply is I'd go to AngelList or I'd go to um, WeFunder or Start Engine or what are these just normal websites and just type in some keywords. They've, they've got a search bar on there. So just type in some keywords, right? Um, fi find it, find something interesting that way. Or if you have a name in mind already, a company that either you work with that um, maybe you're, you're using it every day at the job, maybe you're very familiar with the technology or something of that nature, sometimes you can just find the company online on their website, reach out to somebody on LinkedIn, reach out to some, so some about us on their website and just say, hi, my name is Lucas. I am a, you know, I do this, this, and this. Here's what I'm really knowledgeable about. I would love to come on as some sort of advisor. How can I provide you value? Something of that nature. And by the way, is there a way that I could also invest into your next funding round? Um, I've seen that happen a couple of times where people have done that. I've I've uh, reached out to, I think, two companies over the last couple of years of just saying, hey, I, you guys have never heard of me, but I love you and I use your product and I've got this awesome audience of people and I know growth marketing very well. Like, can I somehow hang out and maybe even invest next go around? And they're like, yeah, sure. Like, let's do a marketing campaign. Let's figure out how to work together. We'd love your expertise. So I definitely, definitely want to encourage people to do that, Lucas. That's a really good idea. Um, just a really good call out from you there. But something else that I forgot to mention earlier is this idea of advisory shares. So whenever you're investing into these startups as an angel investor, normally you're able to negotiate some free extra shares here that you don't pay for, but instead you trade a little bit of time for instead. Think now uh, monthly meetings, right? You're an advisor to the company. You sit down once a month for an hour or two hours on a Saturday or a Thursday or whatever that you want to do there. And in exchange for that, you, uh, you're you awarded advisory shares, which is just more equity in their company without any money. But because now to your kind of point, you have the specific knowledge, you have the network, you have the ideas, you, you understand the technology, you're now able to add additional value versus just, here's my money, thanks for the equity. I think it's important though to, to keep in mind the, for us particularly, is we get highly scrutinized for conflict of interest. Yeah. And so... I think I would just say it, it's interesting because it's almost like a slippery slope, right? You you want to invest in companies that you come from a framework of mm -hmm. this knowledge base yeah. that makes you so much more intelligent and articulate when analyzing and saying, hey, these guys are going to hit and it's going to be a home run. Well, the kicker is you probably use that device mm -hmm. to care for patients. Yeah. And so... It is a slippery slope to say, you know, how do you know you're using this? Should we do it? Should we not do it? Should we avoid it? Uh, well, I, I it, it's not illegal, yeah. but it's no, something but that you have to. What should we do? I, I think that you could do it. You just have to, 
when it comes to any educational event or any scientific event, they are going to ask you for your conflict of interest. And you have to openly yeah. tell these uh, what your COI is. And I will tell you, a lot of the societies now are actually not allowing you to participate. And yeah. this is uh, with the new regulations the, I this think year. A good move. I was surprised that a couple of the people that had some stock in, in some startups that were big names mm -hmm. in the Society of Vascular Surgery were actually told that they were not allowed to give talks because they had stock options and yeah. or uh, had uh, equity hold on, on companies. So it's, yeah. it's just an interesting thing, I think, to keep in the back of, of your mind because I'm guessing, Austin, in your line of work, it doesn't really matter, right? You're almost openly saying, hey, these guys are a home run. I'm going to help you. I'm going to invest because I want you to do well. And for us, there's this other layer of scrutiny about are you, you know, are you weaponizing this knowledge and your uh, involvement with the company to for self gain? And is that something that's in a way affecting your your ability to care for patients? You know, yeah. are you doing that for your own good or are you doing it for the good of your patient? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing that I think our audience needs to be sensitive to at least. No, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's super important. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really good call out. I had no idea, obviously. That's awesome. That's that's really cool that you guys uh, are sensitive to that. I, I totally think, obviously, that the patient's care comes first. And so if there's a way to disclose that or make sure that that sort of... Uh, you know, choices made in the in the favor of the patient than 100%. So as we trickle down here on time, would there be anything, is there a book, a reference, something that you, you, you'd give us homework for people to say, hey, I really, this guy's, I love what he was saying. Number one is everybody go follow your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's a phenomenal place to get more information. But what if, you know, is there a book that you love reading uh, about this topic that would help people kind of divest a little bit more into this? You know, if I was just starting out and I had no idea about anything financial literacy, I would buy two books right now. One of them was what Lucas said earlier, The Little Book of Common Sense Investing by John C. Bogle. Incredible book, walks you through everything, stock market investing to make it super simple, index funds, dividends, what all that stuff is, super simple. Please buy that book. It's incredible. The next one is a book called Own Your Money by Michaela Aloka. She is a uh, a woman in her late 20s that was able to build a net worth now of over $600,000 out of college because she was so laser focused on understanding how to how to earn, how to tax advantagely invest, as well as uh, budget in very specific manners where she's living very... Um, you know, this is something that Dave Ramsey says a lot with purpose, right? My once I've sort of hit specific financial milestones, I live with purpose versus I try to live kind of like a, a gazelle running from a lion, aka debt with my hair on fire. And so uh, I just I love her book. I recently read it and I couldn't recommend it enough. So again, that is the little book of common sense investing by John C. Bogle and Own Your Money uh, by Michaela Aloka. I'll add one to that, and it's one of my favorite celebrities and podcasters, self proclaimed world's best moderator is Jason Calcanis from the All In podcast. And love Jason, I love that guy. I'd love to, Jason, if you ever hear this, I'd love to meet you one day. Um, <laughs> Angel is called is the book he wrote, and it's how to uh, invest in technology startups. And he waters it down to a six-year-old language. Uh, and, and for me, from a physician coming from, I have no idea what this is. Yeah. He allows you through a very small book, and it, it's a very creative and elaborate way, and he explains it all. So you certainly hit most of those points today, Austin, but I think if anybody wants to dive a little bit more, go ahead, order that on Amazon, and, and it's a great read. And it's a fun fun read. And then obviously, the All In podcast, you want to also follow them. They're, they're always top notch. Yeah, funny enough, I was having breakfast, you know, right before I uh, jumped on here with you guys, and I was listening to their episode recently <laughs> with... Uh, the, I don't know if you heard it yet. The one with uh, Richmond and Richmond that they were talking about. It's pretty cool. It's pretty. I, I just one of my favorite podcasts. Can recommend them enough. One hundred percent. So Wrapping we'll up. let you go because I think we got to wrap it up. Got to be respectful of your time, of our listeners' time. Thank you, Austin, very much for so uh, much. coming and sharing with us. That was that was great. Thanks so much for having me, everyone. Um, you can if you you know email me Austin Hankwitz at Gmail if you have any questions. It's a very 
uh, open email. Uh, so go check that out for sure. If you have any questions, feel free to send that my way. Again, that's the Rich Habits Podcast on Spotify, uh, where we demystify money myths to help you build wealth for, uh, throughout your life uh, by implementing rich habits uh, as it relates to business, finance, and mindset. And if you have any you know, desires to watch my videos on TikTok, go do that too. Those are fun. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everybody. And we'll see you next time. Pura Vida.